galactic exoplanets. So here is Jacob. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming up tonight. Uh, so, the theme for tonight was to talk about weird and unusual discoveries in astronomy. So, I'm going to be talking about a recent discovery here of uh, extragalactic planets. You might notice that I have a question mark uh, in my title. Maybe you guys are familiar, but in journalism, there's sort of an unofficial rule that if you have a, a question mark uh, or a, a yes or no question in your headline, the answer is generally no. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't need to ask it as a question. I'm not quite saying that here. I'm trying to invoke a similar sort of skepticism about uh, the results, and I'll, I'll go through them uh, here in a bit. So uh, I'll first, if you're not familiar, introduce you to uh, the discovery. Uh, it made the news about a little over a month ago. Uh, and so I'm a graduate student, as Michael said, uh, researching exoplanets. I've done a little bit of work in microlensing in the past. Uh, so I was scrolling through Facebook and come across a headline here, scientists discover the first planets outside the Milky Way. I'm not always the most up-to-date with uh, my exoplanet research, but I felt as though this is something that I should have heard about, and so I was quite surprised to see it on Facebook. Uh, and so I thought, okay, cool, this is something I haven't heard of. Uh, let's take a look. So I click on the article, and I'm immediately a little disappointed that they left out a few crucial words here. Scientists may have discovered the first planets outside the Milky Way. Uh, so yeah, we can see that the made for Facebook headline is a little uh, sensationalized here. And indeed in the, the very second sentence of the article, it says a recent discovery that if confirmed uh, could extend the boundary of what we know about the universe. Um, so I read the article, um, it was maybe a little vague. Uh, and so I was skeptical about some of the claims but it's certainly not the, the worst that I've seen on uh, Facebook. Uh, does anybody remember the 15 days of darkness back in uh, November? Uh, yeah, me neither, because it didn't happen, but that doesn't stop people from sharing uh, these sorts of stories. This story is many steps above that, however, uh, because they actually uh, reference and are making use of a uh, peer-reviewed paper uh, that's been published in an actual uh, journal. So my next step then, after reading the article, was to actually go and uh, read the paper itself and figure out what's going on. And so that's going to be the rest of uh, my talk, talking about um, the claims that they actually make in the paper itself. So here's the title of the paper. It's uh, Probing Extragalactic Planets Using Quasar Microlending. So there are maybe a few words that I should uh, go over here and describe a little more uh, so that we know what we're uh, dealing with. First is extragalactic planets. I think we're all familiar with solar system planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, blah, blah, blah. They all orbit the sun. <coughs> then there's something called extrasolar planets. Uh, these are planets also called exoplanets uh, that orbit other stars, so not the sun. And so we know of several thousand of these since their first discovery, but all of them are within just a small portion, or the vast majority of them are within a small portion of our Milky Way galaxy, which is the galaxy uh, that we live in. And so an extragalactic planet is a planet then that would be in another galaxy. Very straightforward. But to put things in perspective, uh, the nearest star to the sun is uh, Proxima Centauri, and that's four light years away. So it takes light four years to travel uh, to Proxima Centauri. The circle that I showed in the um, picture of the Milky Way, that small circle where we know of most of our exoplanets, that's 300 uh, light years uh, in radius. The Milky Way galaxy itself is about 100,000 light years uh, in diameter. And the nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, is about two and a half million uh, light years away. So 
we start getting to very large distances, which is why I was a little skeptical of some of the claims of, of finding planets uh, at first. So next uh, is the word quasar here. Uh, this is basically a shortened term for something, uh, a quasi-stellar object. This is basically just a star-like object. It's uh, when they were first discovered, um, they looked in the sky, saw these things that looked like stars, uh, but they found that they had properties that made them uh, different than, than normal stars, and so they couldn't quite figure out what it was. After decades of research, we now know that these are, in fact, just very distant galaxies. Uh, like our own galaxy, um, these galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center. Unlike uh, the Milky Way, our own galaxy, uh, the black holes at the center of these galaxies are actively eating material. So there's gas that's being accreted onto the black hole, and this is giving off a huge amount of light right in the center of the galaxy. And so what this means is that this large amount of light, I saw somewhere that it was equivalent to, say, taking the light from the entire Los Angeles region and putting it into a single flashlight. Um, if you take something like that, put it very far away, it's in a small area, it's going to look just like a star. And, but we can see these across very, very large uh, distances. Microlensing, uh, we got a bit of this from uh, Howard's talk. Um, so basically, if you have a, a distant light source and the light passes near a massive object, it causes the light to deflect slightly and you get sort of these apparent positions of uh, your background light source. Now, what, um, oh right. So here's just sort of an example of uh, lensing between galaxies. So we have some foreground galaxy in the yellow here and it's stretching out the light um, of a background galaxy uh, sort of into this ring shape and it's called the Einstein ring uh, because of Einstein's theory of general relativity. But microlensing is this same principle on a very, very small scale, a micro scale, um, if you will. So instead of galaxies, um, this is between two stars. If you have two stars that get into the perfect alignment, um, you can get a similar effect. However, this ring size is a lot smaller. So uh, the size of this ring is of order micro arc seconds, which is why it's called microlensing. So if you imagine sort of from horizon to horizon, if you um, divide that into 180 degrees, take one of those degrees and divide that into 60 arc minutes, and then take one of those arc minutes and divide it into 60 arc seconds, and then take one of those arc seconds and divide that into one million micro arc seconds, that's the, uh, the scale. So we're not seeing this with stars. Instead, what we're seeing is the images are still there, it's just we can't resolve them, we can't distinguish them, but the star appears to get slightly brighter. And so don't worry too much about what's going on at the top, but if you watch a star as they get into alignment, you get this peak in magnification uh, over time if there's a microlensing event. And so this is two stars getting into the perfect uh, alignment. Uh, and so just to reiterate then, what we have is we have some background source that's very bright, and it's being lensed by a nearby fainter object that we sometimes can't even see, but we know that it's there uh, because of the microlensing event. And now you imagine that you put a planet around this lensing star, and you get some weird perturbations to um, this deflection. And so instead of the nice smooth peak that we saw before, there's some deviation due to a planet, and this deviation takes different shapes uh, depending on uh, the exact configuration of the planet. And so this is how we use microlensing to discover uh, planets in our own galaxy. And so I think we have now all the building blocks to go into the actual uh, paper itself here. So here's an image then of uh, a of the, the event that we're looking at here, which is a foreground lensing galaxy and some background quasar that's been lensed into four images. So you might be saying, Jacob, wait a second, I thought that we can't make out images if it's microlensing, and you're correct. Uh, so this is, on this scale, still just strong lensing between galaxies, but within each of these images, 
uh, there will be some microlensing um, perturbations that will. Is this uh, all in the optical, the or is this in the optical, or is this radio? Yeah. Uh, that I'm not actually sure of. I know that they look at it in the X-ray um, to make their measurements. I don't actually know what. I just sort of pulled that image from the. Uh, uh, the press releases, I didn't look too much into it. This micro arc second thing makes me think it might be radio. It could be. So this this last image is certainly not micro arc seconds. These, these are... Yeah, so that's uh, optical. Yes. We'll say optical. Hope that's correct. Uh, okay, so they, they made a, a lot of observations. Uh, somewhere around 38 observations over the span of a decade of this, um, this lensing event um, using the Chandra X-ray Observatory. So they're looking in the X-ray because um, if you imagine at the uh, very close to the, the center of this quasar galaxy, all this hot material um, is getting heated, it's giving off a lot of light, uh, and some of that is coming off in the X-rays. And so you can look at X-ray emission uh, specifically, they're looking at iron uh, near the, the center of this quasar uh, to measure uh, the energy of the emission. So there's, I think, one more little missing puzzle piece uh, to complete the picture, and that is redshift and blue shift. So here we're imagining a quasar with stuff falling into the black hole, uh, but things are also rotating around uh, this quasar, and quite quickly, uh, the closer you get to um, the black hole. So um, you may know that things that are moving towards you are blue shifted and things that are moving away from you are red shifted. And so on one side of this um, accretion region, uh, at close to the center of the black hole, things will be moving towards you and they'll be blue shifted. And these things will appear to be at higher energies uh, than the other side, which is moving away from you and is red shifted. So blue shifted has higher energies, Redshifted has lower energies. So they make sort of a simulation of, of what this accretion region might look like, uh, sort of scaled here by higher energy and lower energy. And so uh, you can imagine that if you just had a normal quasar, you were just looking at this, and you were sort of collecting all the light from this region, it would average out to some uh, overall energy that you would measure for, um, in this case, the iron X-ray emission. But now, if you um, imagine that some area of this is magnified, uh, this might be changed slightly, and so that's what we'll get to in just a second. Okay, so again, this is the, the image that uh, we're looking at, and specifically they're looking at, I keep using image, these are images of the background quasar, I used this to refer to the figure, the picture um, image. But, um, remember that this is a galaxy that's doing the lensing, and the strong lensing, the galaxy as a whole, is um, accounting for each of these four images of the background quasar. But uh, this galaxy itself is composed of billions of stars. And so each of these stars might be um, contributing a slightly different effect to each of these images, depending on the exact configuration uh, uh, on a star basis as opposed to um, a galaxy basis. And so here's again a representation. If you have a star that's magnifying, say, this little area, uh, you'll see more of this pink region um, compared to the whole, and so you would measure overall a lower um, energy on this given observation if the star happens to be magnifying this um, exact region. And so that's what they did. They sort of took all their 38 observations, they figured out what the energy shifts were for each of these observations, and tried to um, match that using um, uh, their, their data. And so the problem comes in uh, that the actual magnification area of a star is something much bigger than the uh, accretion region of the quasar. And so with just a star, um, you can't account for uh, if you imagine this as your magnification region, you're magnifying the entire accretion region sort of evenly, and so you're, um, you're not going to get an overall energy shift. And so they get something like, uh, in 30% of their observations, they, have, uh, they measure an energy shift. Uh, so in reality, I've sort of simplified things. This is a, an actual figure from their plot. Um, 
this is a, a little more confusing, but if you imagine this um, sort of as just a, we've taken a chunk of the sky, or imagine laying this on the sky, and this is mapping to some magnification on the sky. There's a black line here that maybe um, is a possible path for uh, a quasar um, over 10 years. And so you can kind of see that it's going to go through changes in magnification. Uh, but the problem is, is that they say that it's simply not um, enough. They, um, with this, they can only account for about 1% of the time measuring a, a significant energy shift. And so if stars alone aren't enough, you have to add in planets that have much smaller magnification regions. And so you're able to get these um, magnifications of uh, things that are very close to the center of the accretion region, but not magnifying everything equally. And so here's another figure that shows what happens when you add in planets. The scale is much, much smaller now. Um, you don't need to worry too much about that, but there's all of these little tiny perturbations in here that if you imagine a path across um, there, uh, the same path that we saw before would be probably a lot, lot bigger. Um, but you're going to get more of these magnification events and you'll measure that shifted energy. Okay, so um, what I haven't explained is that these are not bound planets. They didn't add planets to the stars that they already had. Um, I can get into that in the, in the questions, but um, these are free-floating planets. So these are basically just like stars, except they're smaller. Um, they're planets that aren't orbiting a star um, and just sort of free-floating, roaming uh, planets. And so to explain the 30% of the time uh, they measure an energy shift, they need something like 2,000 planets per star that are free-floating planets in the range from Moon to Jupiter's size. So you may be thinking, wait, hang on, hold on, just a second. Let me, let me reword that. For every star in the lens galaxy, then, you need 2,000 objects between the Moon and Jupiter mass and 200 of those have to be between Mars and Jupiter mass. So these free-floating planets outnumber stars in, in this galaxy 2,000 to 1. It seems like a lot of planets, maybe, maybe too many planets. Uh, so let's, let's ground this just a bit. Uh, there's something in microlensing um, called the, the SUMI result. Um, you don't need to know too much about what's going on here, other than there's a bump here. And to explain that bump, they need something like uh, two to three and a half free-floating planets per star in the Milky Way. These are observations in our own galaxy. This was uh, a fairly controversial result. A lot of people um, did not agree with it. They said preposterous. Uh, and uh, it was seen as absurdly high. And in fact, it was. More recent re results in 2017 with better data have shown that this bump um, isn't really uh, needed anymore. And so you can explain our, our galaxy um, with only one re free floating planet uh, every four stars. And this seems maybe more reasonable. It seems a little absurd that uh, uh, you would have maybe two planets that have gotten kicked out per star. Uh, but let's now take this number in our own galaxy, 0.25 free-floating planets per star, and recall that this result in this paper that you've discovered extragalactic planets is claiming 2,000 per star. And so I'll pose the question, are free-floating planets in this lens galaxy really 10,000 times more common than in our own Milky Way? And now I am trying to uh, follow the journalism rule. Maybe not quite so hard. Uh, I'll just say it's doubtful. But this is this is science in action. Uh, we have a result, and it seems preposterous. Uh, but it's going to excite more people to look at this data and observe it more carefully. Uh, and you saw with the SUMI result that it took about six years before we actually got the the necessary data and good enough quality to say that we didn't need. Uh, that, that bump, and so hopefully something similar will happen here, we'll get a more reasonable uh, explanation uh, for this. So that's all I have. I will open us up to questions then.
question. Completely separate. How many you just talked about? Well, maybe not quite. So when the next eclipse is like seven years, we're going to go through the end, it's in the end. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to go through my side of the question again. So how do I get the picture of the background so I compare with that day? Um, so, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Um, the question is about uh, the future eclipse coming up uh, passes through the, the U.S. in uh, 2024. How you can repeat Einstein's experiment and look at the background stars to prove uh, lensing. Um, in the specifics that I'm, I'm, I really don't know. There was actually an amateur science project during the last eclipse that was attempting to redo the Eddington experiment. They had to have everybody who was supposed to contribute, that was going to contribute, had to have exactly the same telescope, exactly the same camera in order to do it because the, the, the shifts are so tiny that it was hard to detect on amateur equipment. Some photograph before the eclipse yeah. at night. Yes. Wait for the sun to come and take the photograph again during the photograph. Right. Yeah, you, you would definitely need some comparison, which would need to be like six months uh, before. So six months be not too close. That's enough time. Well, so, I mean, you could you could do it. Closer the better, I'm sure, but you have to be able to see it. Right, yeah, and when it's. When it's because they're not going to do it. Yeah. Well, that's what I want to know. I'll start with that. It's on the list. Yes. Thank you. So, for the solar eclipse, the deflection is, is if I remember correctly, 1.7 seconds of arc. Okay. So, it's like a thousand times more than what I described right, as Hubble right. vision. So, it's, it's actually a very large effect. Yeah. So you, you wouldn't really have to worry about the stars moving in six months. Okay, so okay, from when you took the reference observation to the eclipse of the All right, cool. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes, the end. If it's not planets, then what is the signal that we saw? Okay, so the question is, if it's not planets, uh, what is the signal that they saw? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think, so I'll be honest, I don't know a whole lot about the, the quasar microlensing, so this was all sort of new to me. Um, I think that, I, I don't know enough about how they did the stars only um, synthesis. They they had sort of the, this, this image, and I, I didn't really see any quantitative thing. This is a random path that they've chosen and they say it doesn't explain it um, and you get something like one percent instead of the thirty percent uh, energy shifts that they they saw i could imagine maybe a path that goes through here that gets a lot of them i mean we're talking about chance alignments and weird things happening and so i would say i would want to know sort of the most that you could get from stars would be and perhaps they did this and they took lots of random uh, that's i would imagine that they did but um, the other thing that I think uh, they didn't go into a whole lot. So they didn't, they added these planets as bound planets, or as unbound planets rather, uh, because uh, a bound planet um, won't change the magnification region much of the star itself. However, um, if you have a, a planet that's very, very close to the to star, um, you, you get the, the caustics, the planetary caustics, um, they just keep moving further and they get smaller and smaller. So if you have, say, thousands of planets, or I mean, thousands is still maybe too many, but for one planet, you can get two planetary caustics. Uh, if you have a planet, perhaps, that's bound around uh, these stars, you would probably still be able to fill this with lots of planetary caustics. Um, that are similar scale to probably the perturbations that they saw in the other magnification map. So, I, yeah, I, I, I would like to know more, uh, sort of about what they did and maybe the the choices uh, that they made. But I, I think it, yeah, we'll see. I guess.
two things. First, I have some more of these uh, little uh, bookmark animations of the light up there. So, if anybody would like one, stop by my table. The other one was, so if, you had, if you had 10,000 times as many, how far away would the nearest free floating planet be from us and should we be worried? <laughs> You mean if the Milky Way had? Our solar system. If there were 10,000 planets, planets and stars. Yeah, uh, I mean that's a that's a good question. I uh, I think people heard he had a microphone, uh, but um, yeah, I think I think there would be a worry that if they start outnumbering stars by that many, how many of them are really unbound um, and even. Um, they could be maybe very, very wide, widely bound, but um, at a certain point they become the same thing. Um, as far as collisions, yeah, it's it's probably a, a worry. Um, I don't know how much of a worry. Also, um, I remember uh, back to Angie's question. I um, I also think to me, again, I don't know how they they did their how they populated the galaxy full of stars. Um, but I could imagine that if your star stars only case only um, only gave you a couple percent and you needed 30%, in my, in my head maybe it would be easier to just sort of arrange the galaxy so that your line of sight passes through 30 times as many stars than, than you previously thought instead of adding 2,000 planets for every star. But uh, that's that's me. I don't I don't know if that's if that actually works or not. Um, I haven't looked into that. But. So going back to the headline when it says they discovered extragalactic planets. Yes. The, they're, they're not saying we found one and here's the thing. They're yes, saying they, it's, it's a statistical population sort of, yeah. But couldn't you just take a look at, at our little uh, two, three hundred light years uh, and statistically map that onto every galaxy and say, hell's yeah, there's <laughs> planets out there. Get over it. And yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you could do that. It's, a, it's, a, yeah. It's not like a discovery of planets. Like, oop, this one, this one's named Tim, and uh, it's got two other friends in that system or something. Yeah, it's nothing like that. Uh, it's just a sort of to explain the data. We need to throw in a lot of planets in this galaxy, and these are their size well, we're distributions. We're discovering planets uh, uh, surrounding every red dwarf now, with five to ten planets per star anyway. Right, so yeah. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, the interesting thing here was one that it, uh, that we happen to be able to do this for another galaxy because you need I think um, you need the background to be a, a quasar uh, to have that um, that close uh, accretion region that has the very fast rotation so that you can have small enough magnifications that get really close to that and um, really give you a, a strong energy shift if it were just some other um, background light source you wouldn't um, be able to do that um, and so it's it's interesting for that reason, and um, because they're unbound planets, and we sort of have a handle of, of that in our own galaxy, but here's another galaxy that we can fill full of planets. So is it possible, however, like however remotely, slightly possible, is it possible that this is due to aliens? <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take a break. Thank you.